Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, Bridgepoint Community Church. And you are joining us for our Wednesday night weekly Bible study. And uh, we're so glad that you're taking time out of your day. I know many of you are busy. You've probably just come home from work. And even though you might be physically tired in your bodies, we know that your heart and your mind is prepared to receive God's word today. So let me welcome you once again and uh, pray that as you join us, whether here on Facebook Live or on Zoom, that you will be able to make the most out of our evening together. And let's uh, seek the, the, um, the wisdom and the strength of Christ by opening with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this evening. We're grateful for all that you have given it to us this far. And even tonight, Lord God, as we spend the hour today together, just studying your word, learning from you, being filled by your spirit, we pray that you will be glorified in all that we do this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, believe it or not, we are uh, going to bring to a close our series today on the story. Uh, we've been at it for well over a year, and the reason for that, of course, is we practically took a one-year break uh, from this because of some of my health concerns, and uh, it, it took this long for us to uh, get together. And so for the last couple of weeks, we've been wrapping up our discussions on the story. Once again, if you're just joining us for the first time, the story is a series that started with the book of Genesis. And we went through virtually every segment or every book of the Bible, tying it together. And tonight we will be dealing with the book of Revelation. And that will bring to an end our discussion. Our hope is that you will see the Bible as uh, one of two things. One is a, it is a cohesive story of the work of God in human history, but it's also made up of stories, uh, you know, sort of subplots in the whole uh, work that God is doing. And we want this, the subplots to make so much sense. We want them to tie together so that we don't miss out on what the overarching idea of the Bible is. So let's begin our, our last discussion on the story. We will be talking about the book of Revelation. I've entitled my message tonight, The End of Days. And there's a reason for that. So let me ask you this. When I say book of Revelation, what is the first thing that comes into your mind? Think about it for a second. Revelation. And as you're thinking about that, I look back at the very first time I heard Revelation or I even knew there was such a book in the Bible, I must have been in sixth or seventh grade. Um, and I just heard my classmates talk about scary things, you know, end of the world, the future. And then I heard them mention about the Antichrist and that you find information about him in the book of Revelation. So that got me curious. And at that time, I did not own a Bible. There was no Bible in the house where I grew up. So I went to um, the library of my high school and I um, was able to find a Bible. I borrowed it. I took it home with me. And so the first book, I didn't completely read it from cover to cover, but the first book that I explored in the Bible ever was the book of Revelation. In fact, I, I remember I went straight to Revelation 13 because that's where my classmates said you'd get the story of the Antichrist. And after I read Revelation 13 for the first time, it was so full of symbolism and mystery. And uh, to be honest, it actually scared me uh, because I did not understand it much that I really didn't bother to read the rest of the book. I returned the Bible to the library without reading much more than that. It really took a while, another couple of years, um, when I gave my life to Christ and I started reading the Bible in a more systematic way that I realized I could not escape but read the book of Revelation, whether I liked it or not, because if I was committed to reading all of Scripture, I would definitely have to read the book of Revelation. Uh, thankfully, it was the last book of the Bible, and so I was able to, you know, sort of delay the reading of Revelation uh, when I started reading the Bible from cover to cover, but the inevitable came and eventually I started to read it. I still didn't understand much of it, um, but I figure that if I just keep coming back to the lessons of Revelation, 
reading it over and over, then maybe I'll begin to understand it more. So wherever you are in your journey of making sense of revelation, I want you to know that if you just stay with it, you know, take the time to understand the book and then read it as many times as you need to, to get a feel for the best way to read revelation, then I think you'll um, overcome your apprehension, you'll overcome your fear, and you'll start to gain an appreciation for it. In, um, in biblical interpretation, we always say that you have to read the books of the Bible, not so much literally, as much as you read it literarily. In other words, you treat each document of the Bible as a unique piece of literature. And if you can appreciate that, you'll know how to read it properly. For instance, uh, for the last couple of Sundays, we've been studying 2 Timothy, and we know that 2 Timothy is an epistle, a letter. So you have to read it as a letter. You can't read it as a narrative. You can't read it as a prophetic uh, document. You have to read it as a letter being written by one person to another. And then if you can read it at that level, you'll under understand it better. Well, when you go to the Bible and you go to Revelation, the last portion of the Bible, this last segment right here, this is what we call apocalyptic literature. I know it sounds a little intimidating, but uh, the word apocalyptic from the Greek apokalupsis simply means to unveil or to uncover. That's all it means. So when you read the book of Revelation, think of it as um, like, like eating a, a fruit, you know, like a banana or a mango or something like that, where you have to peel the outer layer of the fruit before you, you chew into it, before you bite into it. And, you know, the, the more you peel, the more you're able to consume the product. And then before you know it, uh, you've been able to actually take a good, you know, grasp, a taste of what the fruit is like. And hopefully if you develop an appetite for it, you'll come back to it. You'll eat more bananas, you'll eat more mangoes. And just like that, if you peel the layers off Revelation, you'll start to see that the symbolism makes a little more sense, you know, the mystery becomes a little more understandable. And every time you read it, you're peeling off the layers and it's becoming less and less intimidating and more and more interesting. And, you know, I've been a Christian for, I think over 40 years now, I must have read Revelation maybe only uh, three or four times in my lifetime. And it's, it's a book that uh, honestly, sometimes I avoid I haven't really preached a lot of sermons from Revelation, but maybe one of these days I might be brave enough to actually teach the whole book and let's see where that takes us. So let me give you a primer on how to appreciate the book of Revelation. And then some of you might want to venture into reading it. It has about uh, 22 uh, chapters. And so if you actually start reading Revelation now, and read about a chapter a day, you'll be done before the year is over. So that's, you know, if you're not in the middle of a reading plan, uh, that might be something you might be interested in doing. But let me give you some basic data about the book of Revelation. Um, obviously, we know that the title of the book is Revelation. Uh, in the original language in which the Bible is written, it is simply called the apocalypse, the apocalypse or the revealing of the mysteries of God. Now, who wrote Revelation? Um, it's right there in the, in the book. You know, it is written by the Apostle John. Of course, when we read the Bible, we meet a couple of Johns. So this is not John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist died very early in the ministry of Jesus. This is John the Beloved, the same guy who wrote the Gospel of John, first, second, and third uh, epistles of John, and then finally, he writes the book of Revelation. So John is responsible for writing five documents that made it to the Christian Bible, right? The Gospel of John, three epistles of John, and then the book of Revelation. Now, what we know about John is he is the only one of the 12 that died of what we call natural causes. In other words, he was not killed by anyone. He was not martyred by anyone, but he lived to a ripe old age. And he's writing this in an island called Patmos. And the reason he's in the island is because he was banished there. So instead of punishing him with death, 
the empire punished him with exile. He was banished to a little island called Patmos. That's where he spent the last few years of his life. And it was in the island of Patmos that God showed him a series of visions. And then he put into writing these visions and the product, the end product of his writings is what we know today as the book of Revelation. So he must have completed the book of Revelation around 95 AD. If he was around Jesus's age, you know, in the beginning, so he's almost 100 years old, you know, he's already in his 90s by the time he's writing this. And so shortly after writing Revelation, then he dies of what we call natural causes or simply old age. Okay, so that's sort of the, the story or the background behind Revelation. Now, 22 chapters, you know, how do you make sense of that? Usually when we study a book of the Bible or a document of the Bible, we look for a key verse or a key passage that will help um, kind of summarize you know, what that book or that document is about. And in the book of Revelation, I believe that the key passage or the um, third of the central passage is Revelation 21. Let me read it for you uh, from my Bible. And I'm reading from uh, the new or the English standard version. Revelation 21, the first four verses, you have it on the screen and you can read along. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Then it goes on to say, um, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I'd like you to pay attention to that line, the former things have passed away. Why does this line mean a lot, you know, to helping us understand the book of Revelation? Because when the Bible says the former things pass away, you have to ask yourself, well, why are they passing away and what is replacing it? In other words, the book of Revelation is tied to the very first book of the Bible, which is Genesis. So you cannot understand Revelation without understanding Genesis. And I would argue all the other books and documents in between, because it's almost like the book ends. You know, if, if you think of the Bible as a sandwich, Genesis and Revelation are the pieces of bread that hold this sandwich together. You know, Genesis is the beginning of all things. Revelation is the end of things as we know it, as uh, demonstrated in Genesis. So it's kind of like a, a full circle, if you will. What was started in Genesis and what was lost because of the fall is regained. The old things will pass away and the new things will come. And the most important symbol for all of that, you'll find in the early verses of chapter 21, this phrase, New Jerusalem. Did you notice that? It says the New Jerusalem, the city of God coming down from God from heaven. Now, in the Bible, the word Jerusalem can mean a lot of things. You, it could mean a literal city uh, that is found in Israel today, the city of Jerusalem. It could be figurative. It could be sort of the, the place where God meets with people because it was the place where the temple was. Uh, but Jerusalem can also mean the people of God themselves. It's a, it's a euphemism. It's a fig, figure of speech of God's people. The city is made up of the believers from Genesis all the way to Revelation that make up the body of Christ. So when the Bible says, I see the new city coming down from heaven, there is an allusion to those who had passed away, believers who had gone ahead of us, now being joined with the believers who wait for the coming of Christ. And there is a restoration of this new Jer Jerusalem, the people of God joining together in this new heaven and the new earth that God is creating. So if that is the central theme of the book of Revelation, you can then appreciate 
um, how you read it from, from chapter one to chapter 22, because as long as you keep in mind that when you're reading Revelation, you have to think, oh, God's restoring something. God is wanting to um, bring closure to the what was lost in Genesis and the succeeding books of the Bible. And then God is wanting to restore the people of God in the city of God. Then you have this f- feeling of I'm, I'm appreciating, I'm understanding why all this data is in the book. But to simplify this further, I, I want you to kind of think of the book of Revelation as a story of three parts, you know, not equal parts, but each segment deals with an aspect of that restoration. And then it kind of builds on top of the other so that we, we can appreciate the flow of the book. So the way I divide it is that the first segment is chapters one, two, and three. And we refer to this as the chapters that cover the letters to the seven churches. Um, During the pandemic, I did a series on the seven letters to the seven churches, you know, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatara, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. We dealt with each church, each issue. And I think you can go to our archives and YouTube uh, to kind of revisit those sermons and kind of refresh yourself of what it is. But we find that in the opening part of Revelation. So God is dealing with actual churches that existed in the first century, the first couple of centuries. The middle of Revelation is what we call apocalyptic visions or visions of the unfolding of God's work, historical unfoldings, but also leading towards a futuristic understanding of what the book is about. So that's where it gets kind of um, weird or it gets a little tricky because there's a lot of symbolism, horsemen, vials, Uh, darkness, uh, you know, the symbols of the beasts and the dragon and the Antichrist. You know, it's almost like reading um, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia or or like reading, you know, sort of the the fantasy books that are coming out in our libraries today. You kind of get that feel, you know, that it's dealing with those kinds of issues. So um, you have to make, to, to interpret it, you have to make sense of the symbols. You have to Make sure that you're not over-interpreting or you're over-simplifying uh, the ideas there. You have to get into the mind of the writer and you have to constantly test your theories. You know, just because you think you understand a passage in Revelation, the more you learn, the more you, re- you realize, oh, I might have to change this view. I might have to adapt a new way of understanding. And that's okay, because I think it takes a lifetime to master the book of Revelation. Then the last portion of Revelation, uh, as you see on your screen, is it's, it's about the futures, future predictions. Uh, chapters 20, 21, and 22 have to do with events that the, apparently have not yet happened, but it's giving us a glimpse of what is going to take place. Now, this is important because um, when I asked you the question earlier, what comes to your mind when you hear the word revelation, most people would say the future, right? Most people go, oh, revelation, that's about the future. Um, In fact, about 80% of evangelicals believe that the book of revelation, apart from the first three chapters, is about things that have not yet transpired and will transpire in a day that is yet to come. And because that is the prevailing view among evangelicals, and and Bridgepoint is generally sort of an evangelical, you know, sort of born again church. And so we often fall under that category as far as theology is concerned. But would it surprise you if I said to you, that's not the only way to interpret Revelation? There are actually many ways to interpret Revelation that sometimes has nothing to do with the future. Surprisingly, some people will look at Revelation and think of it as a historical book or something that is about the past. So in this next segment, let me share with you the four ways that the Christian church has historically tried to make sense of Revelation. So the four views. Uh, If you look at your screen, number one, we have the preterist view, the historicist view, the idealist view, and the futurist view. 
So what, what are these views and what do each of these words mean? Uh, the terms are fancy, but I think that's because theologians uh, need to make it sound um, you know, important. But the, the interpretation is actually very simple. So let me put it this way. The preterist view, the word preterist simply means the past, right? So in the preterist view, it is based on an understanding that the book of Revelation, when you read Revelation, you're reading about things that have already happened. You know, the seven churches are churches from the past. The, the crowns, the vials, the horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, the dragons, the antichrist, that all took place in the past. And so John is writing history or something that's already taken place and it's done. It's not about the future. It's not about things to come. It's about, you know, what has transpired. So for instance, the dragons and all the other kingdoms could refer to Greece and Rome and, uh, you know, all the other um, empires of the past. The Antichrist could be a reference to the emperors of Rome, you know, the people who persecuted Christians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one way to interpret Revelation, not to look to the future, but actually to look at the past. A second way to interpret Revelation is as a historian or a historicist. In other words, Revelation and the structure of Revelation is such that when you break it down into pieces, it provides an outline for how history will unfold leading to the second coming of Christ. Now, interestingly, the historicist view relies heavily on the seven churches in Revelations 2 and 3, right? And they say that each church represents a face or a segment of church history. So for instance, the first church, the church of Ephesus, um, the historicists will say that refers to the early church or the apostolic church. That's the time of Peter, James, John, and all the apostles. Then the church in Smyrna, the next church, that refers to uh, the patristic period, the period right after the apostles, how the church was moving out of just the Jewish context into a more global context. And then the church in Pergamum, uh, they would say refers to the Romanization of the church. You know, when the church became um, based in Rome and then uh, Constantine made Christianity the state religion of Rome, they say that's what is being described in the church in Pergamum. Then the church in Theatera, that is the period from the time of Constantine to just before the Reformation uh, with Martin Luther kind of, you know, entering the scene. And then the church in Sardis, they, they would say, oh, that's the Reformation. It describes how this new movement starts and there's a going back to scripture. There's a re revival that's taking place in Europe. And then the church in Philadelphia, which is, uh, you know, the city of brotherly love, they say, oh, that's the, you know, that's the kind of the modern church that takes place after the Reformation leading to the early 1900s. Uh, sort of the forerunners to the church that we have today. And then finally, the church of Laodicea, um, the historians will, will say, oh, that's the postmodern church. We're in it right now, but it will continue for a few more years. And then that will bring to an end the seven periods of the history of the church. Now, if, if they are correct, and I'm not saying they are, but if they are correct, then we are today in the last phase of the seven churches, the, the face of Laodicea. That means after our period of Laodicea is over, then the next thing we're waiting for is for Jesus to come. Um, the problem with being too sure about that is that every generation of believers from the time of Christ till today were convinced that Jesus would return in their lifetime. Okay, think about that. Everyone, even Peter, even John, even Paul, they all believe that Jesus will come in their lifetime. But obviously, we know that they, they were not correct in that uh, anticipation. And how do we know that? Because here we are 2,000 years later, and we're still waiting for Jesus to come. So I think a more humble approach is to say, Jesus could come in my lifetime. 
But then again, maybe not. It could be another thousand years. It could be 2000 more years. None of us know the real answer. So it's good that we anticipate that Jesus could come anytime that keeps us ready and vigilant. But we also have to allow in our belief system that we, we still may be a long way off from the second coming of Christ. So just be careful if you hold on to the historicist view that you're not trapped into sort of the seven segments of the book of Revelation. Now, the most loose interpretation of Revelation is the idealist, because the idealist would say, Revelation has nothing to do with place or time. It has nothing to do with geography. It has nothing to do with chronology. They would say that Revelation is purely a method of storytelling that pits darkness and light. In other words, it's the it's the classic um, good versus evil genre that we see in almost every piece of literature. You see it in Narnia. You see it in Star Wars. You see it in Disney movies. You know, you see it in in books and and TV shows that you watch. It's constantly the battle between good and evil. The difference, in my opinion, is that where good and evil used to be very clear and clearly distinct, we're now living in a world where good and evil is actually muddled together, where there's not as much clarity as to who or what is good or who is evil. Let me give you an example. Um, think of the way we tell stories about superheroes today. Um, when I was growing up in the 70s, Batman was always good. The Joker was always evil, right? So Batman and Robin, that's always good. The Joker, the Riddler, the Penguin, they're always evil. But did you notice that in recent years, when you watch stories about Batman and Superman and all that, the heroes who we thought were always good, they, they have a dark side too. You know, they deal with um, depression, they deal with uh, temptation, they deal with ill feelings and, and evil thoughts. And then on the other hand, the villains in these stories, they also have a good side. You know, they, they, they can empathize with uh, the, the poor, the needy, the disenfranchised. You know, um, sometimes they're, they're evil, but their evilness comes from a desire to equalize you know, all that's wrong in this world. So what we see is Batman is good, but he's got a dark side and the Joker is evil, but he's also got a nice side. And so we're not always sure because they, they kind of overlap. We're not sure where does goodness end and where does darkness begin? And that's the problem with the idealist view because if, if life is about the battle of good and evil, where do you fit into that? Because- Think about your own story. I believe, for instance, that everyone listening to this Bible study right now is generally a good person. You know, you guys, you feed the hungry, you give, uh, you give of your resources to support missions, uh, you go to church, you read your Bibles, you're good in that sense. But let's also be honest, as good as we might think we are, we also deal with uh, a dark side to us. You know, our thoughts are not always pure. We don't always wish well towards others. Uh, we might behave once in a while in, in a way that we might be ashamed or is despicable, because even that battle between good and evil within us is both present in our minds and in our hearts. And so it helps us appreciate the book of Revelation, because the lack of clarity between good and evil is so reflective of how life really works. It's true in my life, and therefore the Bible is just very honest to say that not everything that appears good is good, and not everything that appears evil is evil. You have to treat things fairly. But as long as in the end, um, the idealist would say, you have to believe, because we are a people of hope, that goodness will ultimately prevail. And that kind of ties into the last way of interpreting revelation, which is the futurist. Because the futurist will say, the majority of the book of revelation refers to things that are yet to happen. They haven't happened yet. They haven't transpired yet. They're not part of history. We're waiting for it to happen. Okay. 
Let me show you an even more simple way to understand all this. In the preterist view, think of it as the belief that everything in the book of Revelation has already transpired by the fourth, fourth, uh, fifth century AD. By the year 400 AD, everything in Revelation, it's, it's done, it's over, it's history. In the historicist view, the belief that whatever you're reading in Revelation, that's still going on right now. Some of it has already started. We're living it in real time, and then we're awaiting for its completion. So that's how you look at the historicist. In the idealist view, you have to remove time and space from your thinking, because it's not about time and space. It's about the battle within us and the battle around us, that as long as good prevails in the end, then the, the book of Revelation is faithful to its purpose, to why it was written and given to us. And then finally, in the, in the futurist view, you read Revelation in anticipation that what you're reading is still going to happen someday. Much of it hasn't transpired yet, but it will. Okay, so what do we make of this? I think what's important is we at least appreciate what the message of Revelation is, and then we can always debate and make sense of the details as we go or even later on. So three important messages that I think we get from the book of Revelation. Number one, Revelation is a reminder that God has always been in control of human history. At no point has God lost control of what is going on in this world. Some people get the sense that, you know, he created the world in Genesis. He created Adam and Eve, male and female. And then Adam and Eve messed it up by sinning. And sometimes you get the wrong picture that God lost control. God like was like, oh, no, what do I do now? But what you find in Revelation is God never lost control. Because when you look at the flow of the stories of the story, you see that God was working all things together for the good of those that love him and believe in him, and that the end of this part of the story will benefit those who are faithful. So God is in complete control, even though it doesn't seem like the world is under his control. The second uh, lesson we learn from Revelation is Jesus has secured his place in history. Revelation is about Jesus. If you read Revelation 1, John is making known to us the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And then in Revelation 22, he identifies who this Alpha and Omega is. He says, I, the Alpha and the Omega, I, Jesus, say these things to you. So obviously, John, when he's quoting the Alpha and the Omega, when he's talking about the, uh, the preeminence of Jesus, in the book of Revelation, he's referring to the Christ that came the first time and will come again the second time to um, bring about the, the fulfillment of the promise of resurrection. The third message of Revelation is the future looks good for believers. And that's important, right? Because when you look at apocalyptic um, uh, stories and, and movies and, and TV shows, it seems like storytellers paint a very dark picture of the future. Star Wars is very dark. You know, there's always the, the, the dark side, the evil side. Um, you know, things like uh, Battlestar Galactica, you know, in the future, they're still fighting wars. You know, when, when you look at some of the, the more futuristic movies from Marvel or from DC, there's no peace yet, right? And then anything that ends with and they live happily ever after really doesn't because there's continued tension. And, there's, and so the future is very dark as far as that. There's even a movie called The End of Days, you know, with, uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, and um, it, it's about how even in the future, the devil continues to, um, you know, strive and try to uh, make life difficult for the faithful, and there's always that battle taking place. But if you are a believer today, and you are holding on to the promise of Jesus Christ, you do not need to be afraid of the future. 
you don't have to fear what will happen because in the Bible it's already clear that Jesus wins in behalf of the church. We see a victorious Christ. The, the theme, you know, the, uh, the ancient theologians would call it uh, Christos Victor, uh, Christ the victor, Christ the victorious one. Because no matter how the story goes, Jesus wins in the end. And that's a very important part of the story. I've told this story many times about the young boy, you know, who was, uh, the father heard him reading out loud in his room. And the boy, as the father listened to the, uh, through the door, the boy would say, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. And the father was wondering, what's my son talking about? So he goes into the room. And he said, son, who are you talking to? And the son says, oh, dad, I'm, I'm, I'm just reading the book of Revelation. And every time I read a part of Revelation where it looks like the devil is winning, I just remind him that he's going to get it. Because I looked at the last page of Revelation and it says Jesus wins. And so the way the boy relieves himself of anxiety is he reminds himself constantly that no matter how bad life gets, Jesus in the end wins it for us. And so we will be victors with Christ together with him. And so that leads us to uh, one of the more important closing lines of the book of Revelation in chapter 22, verse 20. Uh, John wrote, he who is the faithful witness to all these things say, yes, I am coming soon. And then in anticipation, John says, amen, come Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. He's not afraid of the second coming. He's not intimidated by the idea that Jesus is coming again. He's actually excited with the thought that Jesus comes, that he says, Lord, come, bring it. Let it happen because I'm ready to taste my victory. Amen. So I hope that you at least have something to work with when you read the book of Revelation. Again, I'm going to send you these uh, slides, these notes that you've been looking at in the screen so that you can use it as a help when you read the book of Revelation. But that brings to a close our series on the story. And, uh, you know, thank God for those of us that have endured it. I hope that you have made the most of what it means to us. Let me give you a glimpse of where we go from here. Starting next month, we are going to start a new series and uh, we'll, we'll post some announcements in the coming days. But um, for the month of October, at least, I want to deal with the issue of discipleship and self-care. And what I'm going to do is for the four Wednesdays of um, October, we're going to deal with um, an element or a segment of self-care. I'll start it off next week, but in the succeeding weeks, I will be joined by experts in the field of different areas of self-care where they will uh, these experts will teach us, will share with us their experiences, and then talk to us about some of the issues that we might face. So next week, I'm going to talk about um, just laying a foundation, finding rest for soul, caring for yourself. And I'm going to obviously talk a little bit about my own personal uh, experiences with growing in this area of understanding. Then October 12th, we will be joined by Brother Alvin Vega. Many of you know Brother Alvin. At some point, he was a drummer in our church and uh, one of our uh, music ministers. Uh, Brother Alvin, as, as some of you might know, is actually a mental health specialist for the city and county of San Francisco. So on the 12th, he will be talking about mental health. He will be talking about how mental health affects our discipleship, how it affects our spirituality. On the 19th, we will be joined by Pastor Noel Villarivera. Pastor Noel is a good friend of mine who lives in Seattle, and he is a marriage and family therapist. And what he will do is he will talk about how to make your home a healthy sanctuary for all the members of your family. The home, I believe, should be a place of rest. It should be a place of revival, of renewal. And when you have sanity in the home, it becomes a foundation for you to live a healthy Christian life outside of it. So Pastor Noel is going to help us with that. And then on the 26th, we will be joined by a very good friend of mine. His name is Jason Balch. Uh, he used to be a student of mine at the university, and now he is a chaplain 
uh, mostly in hospitals, and he deals with people who struggle with addiction, uh, with life issues. He himself has a very interesting story to tell, and uh, he will bring his expertise and his knowledge on overcoming addictions. And by the way, I'm convinced that all of us have an addiction. It could be chemical addiction, it could be relational addiction, it could be food addiction. I think all of us deal with some kind of compulsion. So I think whether you consider yourself addicted or not, I think you're going to benefit uh, from this particular topic that we will talk about. So don't forget the next couple of Wednesdays, every Wednesday night at 7.30, we will have a different topic to discuss. And I hope that you, know, you will look forward to that.